What's abortion got to do with it? That's the topic on so many minds since the passage of the new abortion legislation in Texas. And that's why I'm proud to be here today with three leaders in the fight to protect women, children, and put an end at once and for all to domestic abuse around the world. Today's important topic, reproductive control, pregnancy, and intimate partner violence. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, founder of the PR firm and publishing Incandescent Inc., here to welcome you to part two of our three-part series hosted by filmmaker Tracy Schott, producer and director of the award-winning documentary, Finding Jen's Voice. Tracy is the founder of VoicesForChange.net, an international organization working to make a difference in women's lives. Also starring in this interview series is Kelsey McKay, a former district attorney in Austin, Texas, and one of the most recognized national experts on sexual and interpersonal violence, child abuse, and human trafficking. Kelsey is the president and CEO of the National Network Nonprofit, working to raise awareness called Respond Against Violence. Her fellow board mate, her fellow board member, Erica Olson, is also here, a social worker who specializes in gender-based violence and trauma-informed care and management. Erica will share her insights into the far-reaching consequences of government controlling women. And now I'm going to hand it over to Tracy. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Hope. Um, it's really uh, it's ex exciting to be at, you know, at the table with um, this powerhouse of Kelsey and Erica. Um, you know, we're all very passionate about this subject. Um, and if you missed last week's episode, I encourage you to go back and watch it. It um, in that when we really unpack the Texas law, it's a law unlike uh, any other that we've seen, um, in which it's really a it's the government giving um, private citizens uh, the right, encouraging them to create, to um, take civil liberties against other, uh, against people who are helping somebody get an abortion. So it's a complex law. They, they call it an abortion ban, but it's um, more complex than that. And I feel like um, it would be helpful, Kelsey, if you wouldn't mind just saying in one nutshell, can you do it, um, to uh, say what makes this law different? I mean, it's hard to say in a nutshell, but I'm going to do my best. It's it's if you can imagine if any of you have ever had to take an exam, um, you know, for for medical school or law school, this is really written like a law school exam question. There are so many things that just violate normal jurisprudence. So civil procedure is a class every lawyer takes. And right. Someone doesn't get to just stand up and say someone's guilty or did something. It requires that there be parties that really have um, like had a stake in the game. So the person was harmed or they did the harming. It's not just random people suing you. Um, also jurisdiction, it doesn't seem like there's any limit on who can sue you and what just jurisdiction it takes place in. It also, you don't sue the woman who gets the abortion, you sue those who aid and abet it. And then on top of it, unlike most cases that involve abortion, most uh, laws that states pass that could then be constitutionally challenged, what's different about this is the state is not in charge of, of enforcing this law. So what that means is normally we would sue the state and whether it's a private individual or a health clinic would sue the state and it would go up and that ultimately the courts would determine whether or not that law was unconstitutional or not. But they have kind of made it this weird pile where you don't know who to sue to go against the law. They've enabled private citizens by giving them a monetary um, motivation, not only in you can get a reward starting at $10,000, but you also get your attorney fees paid for. Um, so there's like this novel motivation to have these vigilante people go out, sue women with absolutely no probable cause, no baseline for knowledge. You can just do it. And in the end, even if that person loses, so the woman didn't have an abortion or the doctor didn't provide it, there's no recourse for them. They'll already have spent all the money on attorney's fees. And I see, you know, in domestic violence, I see legal abuse used all the time. You know, if she leaves him and there's custody or there's anything he can do to fight that divorce, they just shift over to the institutions and the systems. So where I see it most frequently is in criminal justice 
and in the family court system. Um, and that's something that we don't talk enough about. And this is essentially legal abuse wrapped up in like a spiny thorn thrown underwater with no direction. And so it really is unlike any other law and has really serious implications um, if we were to apply it to all of the other rights that we have in the Constitution. It's it's um, frightening, but it's again, we're talking about legal abuse, which you've already pointed out is something that happens frequently in intimate partner violence relationships, particularly around custody. And we're talking about reproductive control. So when, when the average person hears about intimate partner violence or domestic violence, they think about black eyes, broken bones. Right. But we know that it's about power and control. And it's about um, emotional abuse. It's about financial abuse, financial control. It's about isolation. It's about taking um, a, a woman's ability to really self-care away. And uh, it's very methodical. So in so many ways, this um, state law now kind of mimics the intimate partner violence relationship, which is um, really horrifying because, um, you know, things like the handmaid's tale comes to, to light, you know, it's like, this is like a, a nightmare uh, situation. And it, you know, it feels like that slippery slope of all things can go wrong. Um, so when we talk about reproductive control, we mentioned it a little bit last time, but I, I want to dive deeper into it. And Erica, you've um, got a lot of information that you could share with us about that. So help us really understand what we taught, what we mean when we say reproductive control mm -hmm. and some of the, how prevalent it is. Sure. Um, you know, we use a lot of these terms, right? And whether it's social work or whether we're in criminal justice or making films like yours. And I had a conversation with a male friend of mine and he is typically, I'll call him a male ally. Um, he's very open. He really wants to discuss these things on gender. He's also African-American. And so he really educates me, um, you know, on, on some racial issues as well. And we have this great relationship and we were talking about this law and reproductive coercion and he started talking about, oh yeah, women trick guys all the time into getting pregnant and getting married and having babies. And I was like, that's not what I'm talking about. So I at least have to give a shout out to my friend, Nick, because I realized that what we need to really do for folks is distinguish the difference between unhealthy manipulation in a healthy relationship versus what we mean when we say coercion or reproductive coercion and control. And what we mean by that is, is behavior that's used to either pressure um, or coerce a woman or someone who's got the reproductive capacity to become pregnant, to either get pregnant against their will, or to continue or end a pregnancy against their will. And they're using tactics like intimidation, manipulation, threats, abuse, and violence, um, frequently a combination thereof, but not always. And so in essence, like you were saying, Tracy, it's really the difference is robbing someone of their autonomy to say yes or no to getting pregnant and to continuing or ending their pregnancy. And, you know, Erica, it's not as, you know, when I, when I was trying to understand as a prosecutor, these dynamics of, okay, I keep hearing power and control. I don't know what it means. I really want to understand it. Obviously, I've told Tracy many times that when I watched her documentary, Finding Jen's Voice, it all kind of clicked for me. And I think what's challenging is, with reproductive control is it's like, well, no way, she willingly got pregnant or she willingly got an abortion. And what I think people don't understand is the whole part of course of control in general is that you do something to instill fear in someone else. And it doesn't have to be a physical violence. And that fear controls you and it takes away your personal autonomy. So if it's free will and, and you're not just saying yes, but you actually mean yes, that's very different. And men especially, um, you know, the, these are very gendered crimes. And with men just having you know, naturally different statures, having more control, instilling fears in a different way, and women obviously feeling it different, and sometimes just wanting to please them, it can really be confusing for, for women. If he tells her, you have to get pregnant, and she does it, and then he's like, 
oh, you only did that because you're cheating on me. I think, you know, it's the sense of like, I can't do anything right. And exactly. Step. So I'd love you to talk, you know, about that, that it's not as easy as saying reproductive control is making her get pregnant. You know, Britney Spears, they made her get an IUD to prevent her from getting pregnant. And you so hit the nail on the head, Kelsey, in that it's, it's, um, you know, so we kind of might break it down, but, you know, in general, reproductive coercion and control is harmful in any society or culture, right? Where women don't have access to the tangible real life equality, not just equality on the books, not just theoretical equality, but the real equality that men do. And that's from harassment and discrimination from birth in schools, in equal pay, um, uh, harassment on the job, you know, having those sort of closed doors, good old boy networks, all the way through to where there's just these physical differences that rape, sexual assault, domestic violence, and sex trafficking in particular are very gendered crimes. So that's just overall. Um, but in general, I think what you're talking about really is about what's coercion and, and, you know, why is that so bad? What is that really like? But when you think about real life, you know, there's sort of three pieces to reproductive coercion and control. One is that pregnancy pressure, that pressure on women to um, get pregnant. That could be emotional abuse, could be manipulation. Like you said, you're cheating on me. You don't really love me. You know, if you were committed to this marriage, if you were committed to this relationship, you'd have a baby. They might play on a woman's um, religion or culture, spirituality. You know, you're not being a good Christian, right? Our our duty is to have children. Um, if you don't have this baby, I have to. I have no choice but to leave you. Um, and then certainly the threatening to harm her physically or economically or emotionally. I think the second piece is birth control sabotage. Sometimes we don't think about that. Again, we think, how can that just happen? But particularly when we're talking about abusive relationships or relationships with a lot of emotional, psychological power and control, then interfering with the woman's use of contraception. And so that can look like um, physically or economically preventing her from getting contraception, but it can be a little bit more, in, you know, sort of insidious than that. Um, batterers haven't been known to hide or throw away or destroy her birth control. I've had uh, I've had survivors who are clients of mine talk about how their batterers would literally rip off their contraceptive patches, or they'd rip out the vaginal rings. Um, men, uh, male batterers, can refuse to use or poke holes or damage condoms if that's what they're they're using in their relationship. Uh, they may do what we call stealthing, which is they sl they put on a condom but then they slip it off um, and then ejaculate, and she gets pregnant. Or they may have agreed to pull out, you know, the pull out method during sex. And they might have agreed that he would and then he doesn't. And she becomes pregnant when they agreed that that's not what would happen. And then the third piece of reproductive control, just in terms of kind of defining what that is for folks, is controlling a pregnancy outcome. And that means either forcing someone to continue a pregnancy that they don't want or that is dangerous to them or ending or terminating a pregnancy that is deeply wanted. And what that looks like could be using shame or guilt to manipulate someone into continuing a pregnancy once they're pregnant, providing disinformation or withholding information from a woman so that she can't make fully informed choices, isolating her from her support systems. We know that abusers in particular and traffickers absolutely isolate their victims from any type of support network or information. Um, uh, partners can physically or financially prevent a woman from being able to obtain an abortion or abortion or uh, reproductive health care. They can actually abuse the woman in terms of either forcing her to try to keep a baby or force her to get an abortion. Some batterers assault their partners in hopes of causing a miscarriage. And others just make these insidious threats. They're going to cause harm. They're going to out her about something or tell her family something about a skeleton in her closet that basically they, they talk about how they might ruin her if she doesn't follow through with a pregnancy that she doesn't want. And so I, I, I think when we look at all of this, um, it's, it, you know, not only is reproductive coercion or harm um, harmful in general for women, but there's this subgroup of folks, women who are involved in domestic violence, sexual assault, or human trafficking situations. And for them, it's really, it's particularly insidious and dangerous. Um, well, and it's like 
it, you know, they can weaponize not just pregnancy, but abortion and reproduction in general. There's, there's so many areas. I remember handling a case as a prosecutor where she was strangled and sexually assaulted. And she didn't want to go forward with the sexual assault because she knew in the sexual assault exam, you know, they ask, have you ever been pregnant? And she knew that she'd had an abortion. And she knew that if he got that in discovery, he would kill her and he would use it to weaponize her. And then I've had many cases where women have confided to their partners they've had an abortion. And then, of course, when she's trying to leave him, it gets used as a technique to say, oh, I wonder what your mom's going to think when I tell her about the abortion you had. So, I mean, they, yeah. they do it as a way to not allow women to leave. So when people say, you know, why didn't you just leave? It's because all these tactics, when you're an abuser, you collect yeah. them. And, you know, it's it's it makes no sense. And I've just seen the use of abortion be weaponized against a woman so much, as well as you're not getting pregnant. You must not love me or it's someone else's. I mean, it really doesn't. It just comes in so many different flavors. Um, but I'd love it could Tracy or Erica. One of the things I thought was fascinating when I was a prosecutor was learning that there were certain indicators that increase the likelihood that, you know, domestic violence isn't all apples and apples. It gets worse and it's predictable and it's relatively patterned and um, which hopefully means it's preventable. And so my what I'm interested in is what is it about pregnancy itself that makes women who are in abusive relationships at a higher risk of being killed? Well, you know, think about, um, you know, we're, we're, I think we're all mothers here, right? And um, think about pregnancy. Think about the first time you were pregnant and what your body goes through, what you go through emotionally, how you deal with um, the emotional, hormonal changes that are going on, as well as just the emotional and um, intellectual changes that are going on in the fact that you you go from being a single person or a single person with one child to now that you've you've got more children, um, you know you know that you're it's changing and you're and it so you're distracted, and if you're in an abusive relationship, you're not allowed to be distracted. You are supposed to give your abuser one hundred percent of your attention all the time. And any distraction is taken as a personal slight. And it is also interpreted as um, they, they become jealous because they're sure that the only reason that you can be distracted from them is that you are involved with somebody else. And sometimes when they realize that somebody else is your unborn child, they decide that unborn child needs to uh, go away. Um, and that can be a forced abortion. Um, and in the case of Jen, when she said, no, I don't need you in my life and I don't, I'm not having an abortion. I've wanted to be a mother my whole life. You don't need to be part of this. He killed her. Um, and pregnant women get killed a lot um, and a lot more than what, we, than what anybody can imagine. Um, I know Kelsey, you know, when this, uh, uh, law was uh, passed, you contacted me and you said, I've been pulling up all of the cases just this year in Texas of pregnant women being killed. Like, where, where's our compassion for those people? You know, and you're muted, my dear. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to jump in while she is muted. I'm going to take that because <laughs> I, because I want to talk about how many women does this affect, right? Yeah. Yes. Not that Kelsey can't speak to Texas because as a, as a prosecutor and as someone who works um, so much in strangulation and in training, she certainly sees it. But I mean, the numbers are astronomical. We're talking, you know, according to the NIH, domestic violence affects approximately 300,000 pregnant women annually. And those are the reported ones right? Those are the reported ones. We know that's an underestimate. And um, it's not, in addition to that, in terms of talking about uh, abused women, you know, a woman who's having an unintended pregnancy is actually four times more likely to be in an abusive relationship than a woman having a planned pregnancy. Um, we know no, that roughly- Think about the catch-22 there. Think about, say you, say you were in an abusive marriage, right? And you did seek shelter with another man. Right. That happens. 
what happens if you get pregnant by that other man? You were really caught in a situation now where either he's going to kill you when he finds out the baby's not his, or you have to have an abortion. I think that people forget that not everyone's choices are as <laughs> frankly privileged as mine, where I get to pick what kind of coffee I want every morning and have a warm bed and feel safe. Um, sometimes people have to make choices between really bad things. And I think for so much of this law, um, what I'm seeing is people who are in my situation evaluating its value. And I'm like, but it's not really me that's going to have the problem. I can fly to Louisiana. I can drive to Mississippi. Yeah. It is all these other women who don't have the kinds of choices and other aspects of their life like you're discussing. And I think we have to think about what are the consequences, you know, regardless of whether or not we're talking about women that are in domestic violence, sexual assault, or human trafficking situations. I think we really need to think about pregnancy in terms of its morbidity and its mortality in general for women, particularly when we're looking at SB8, um, which uh, bans all abortions after six weeks. You know, first and foremost, 17 women die per 100,000 live births every year. So make no mistake, the United States has the worst maternal mortality rate of all industrialized nations. We rank 46th in the world, okay? And for every woman who dies in childbirth, which has which the rate has been increasing since 2000, not decreasing, we spend two and a half times more money per individual on in healthcare than any other industrialized nation, and yet, we have the highest maternal mortality rate of any industrialized nation. And for every woman who dies in childbirth, 75 to 100 more women suffer a life-threatening complication during pregnancy and childbirth, according to the Department of Health and Human Services. You know, the maternal death ratio for Black women is two and a half times the ratio for white women and three times the ratio for Hispanic women, some of the most vulnerable people in our society are the ones most harmed by reproductive laws like SBS-8 and similar, similar laws. And I think it's really important because, you know, I see memes online, right? And it's like, you know, it's not an embryo, it's a child. And people say, you don't, you, we, don't, we don't give fetus showers, we give baby showers. I love that romanticized and beautiful part of a wanted, healthy pregnancy. But we forget pregnancy, even the most wanted pregnancy with every resource available is still a serious health condition. And it changes a person's physical and mental health, both temporarily during the nine months, as well as permanently, right? So let's think, I wanna, you know, I wanna just highlight again, what are some of the risks of any pregnancy, regardless of what your situation is? Blood pressure, gestational diabetes, thyroid disease, neurochemicals, hormones that can impact organ functioning, depression, anxiety, preeclampsia, anemia, um, the birth risks and the impact of giving birth, and we're talking any birth, much less forced birth, scar tissue, chronic pain, we're talking hemorrhaging, diabetes, permanent heart disease, thyroid disease, postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, in which those very babies we say that we care so much about are murdered infections, blood clots, and death. You know, getting pregnant is a risk to your short-term health and your long-term health, and it can cause death. And that's, I just think that that's so critical that we remember that when we're talking about abortion laws and we're looking at whose life we value. Well, well, and, and, then, and you put that, uh, um, you lay that up against our ability to provide um, evenly um, uh, delivered health care. Yeah. With all those oh. health risks, and you, you think about those most vulnerable po populations, and they're not going to get prenatal care. Yeah. Um, and, and they're not going to, they're not going to be well taken care of in the hospital. Well, or during the pregnancy, because I mean, one going back to Erica's point about who's, who, who this is going to impact and just thinking about the trafficking community and, I have dear friends who are trafficking survivors and one of them tells this story. I mean, it's the most horrific story I've heard and I've heard a lot of horrific stories. Her being eight and a half months pregnant and kind of taken by a serial offender and uh, it's awful. 
what she went through at eight and a half months. And she ended up giving that baby up for adoption. And it, you know, I started, you know, I'm so honored that she will have any conversation with me because I'm curious. I want to understand. And, you know, for a while I was like, how did she, like she stay eight and a half months pregnant with the amount of rape and beating she experienced daily. And so as we talked about, I was like, so are pimps always mad? Do they want you to be pregnant, not pregnant, but what they go through. So we're going to make someone who is a trafficked individual talk about having no personal autonomy on top of it. You're being raped every day and beaten in many cases and sometimes multiple times and you are dehumanized. So if we want to talk about protecting the vulnerable, let's talk about those humans on earth who are totally dehumanized mm -hmm. by other humans on earth, because that's where we need to rehumanize these same people who want, you know, name things, the hurt Pete bill. I don't see them out on the streets helping with these trafficking victims. I don't see them taking the phone calls um, in the middle of the night, like many of us do um, get down and dirty and make sure that we understand. And so, you know, thinking of her being a trafficked individual and being abused at eight and a half months pregnant, and then still choosing to give that child up for adoption, which she knew she had to, but the risk, but, but she got to exercise her choice, right? Like we have to be careful because a lot of people may take that example and say, see, even the yeah. most, even the most, which is a shame, right. right? Because that's not your point, Kelsey, right? Your point is about her resiliency and her strength. But and not just her resiliency, but the truth and the reality of what prenatal care is like during that time. And so the fact that that baby she had could survive. Made it eight yeah. and a half months pregnant, but with this population who's going to be unable to get an abortion because they can't fly to New York and get one, right? Yeah. They're not going to be you and me. They are going to be the lower socioeconomic groups. They are going to be the trafficked individuals. They are going to be the ones who already have three kids and are holding the young four jobs and are barely surviving. We know things like preeclampsia has a disproportionate impact on women of color. And when you have something like preeclampsia, and it goes undiagnosed, which if you're not getting any prenatal care, which I guarantee you, most of these women will not be, because if they could afford prenatal care, they could afford to have a baby. And so when preeclampsia goes undiagnosed, and that leads to high blood pressure in the mom, that can lead to seizures and death. So, right, there's a reason we had to go to the doctor and then do things like, you know, that glucose tolerance test, and it measures your hormones and the insulin, and that's because we don't want the baby to be too, too big. And so if you get no prenatal care and you have a 15 pound baby and you give birth at your pimp's house, like who's going to die? Maybe both die. they both will. And, and so I'm it's this kind of assumption that everyone has the luxury of prenatal care. And, you know, there's such a disproportionate impact. And so instead of, I don't want to just skip into the birth because there are things that will kill both that baby and that mom. If what we don't include in this is prenatal care and safety. And I know that we're going to talk about some of that in our third podcast, but I want to take a moment to touch base on trauma, right? You talked about the trauma that they go through. And I think it's really important because, um, particularly with SB8, right? When we've talked about this is meant to be a compassionate bill. Um, when we think about trauma and we talk about rape victims, the governor has said, well, when we're not barring it, she's got six weeks. And I want to talk about, I think we've talked in, in the first one about six weeks just in general, once again, that is presuming that, actually it's assuming, and we know what that means, you know, right. makes an ass out of you and me. <laughs> um, so he is assuming a, that all women have regular menstrual cycles, B, that they um, will notice within two weeks with absolutely no stress in their lives that might possibly interfere with their menstrual cycle, which we know stress does. And so we're talking about a window of two weeks for any woman. And that's- And remember best. to take a pregnancy test just because why not? And that, exactly. I mean, that is proactive the day at, absolutely. That's, that, that's just for any woman. That's just the bar, which is right. ridiculous in and of itself. But I want to talk uh, um, again about trauma and about those vulnerable populations um, because trauma just adds an incredible layer to this because it affects the brain. So we sit back and we talk about what we would do in these circumstances and that kind of thing. But trauma impacts the brain, both short-term at acute trauma, as well as long-term. And what I mean by that is that 
trauma impairs our executive function. So it impairs the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that helps us in executive functioning and decision-making and rational choices. Um, and that's assuming, again, that you have all the education to begin with, right? And that you have all the resources and, and information as opposed to disinformation or being isolated from information. But um, when we are in a traumatic situation, and that could be abuse, that could be war, that could be a medical trauma that perhaps pregnancy triggers, um, our nervous system is impacted. And we, uh, our lizard brain kind of takes over, or our nervous system, or our monkey mind, some people call it. And we end up um, resorting to getting into this sort of the four Fs. It's fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, which is in particular important for victims of domestic violence, where they're trying to appease their batterers so they're not, they're not further hurt. Um, but trauma frequently causes PTSD. It causes depression. It causes anxiety. And that impacts that prefrontal cortex. And that impacts the ability to think through and to make decisions and to act on them. And so, you know, expecting a woman who's experienced the trauma of rape or intimate partner violence or human trafficking to make a decision that's going to impact every tiny aspect of her life and well-being through all those catalog of physical and mental health issues that we just talked about, much less housing, financial security, much less the welfare of that child is, is an enormous ask that SBA doesn't allow her to have. And it's unconscionable and it ignores and flies in the face of every science under the sun that we think women who have been traumatized can make that kind of decision or should have to make that kind of decision in two weeks or less, you know, in days. And, you know, um, let's, let's also talk a little bit about um, the impact of trauma on babies. When a woman is pregnant, um, the, the fetus, the baby, the unborn child is more likely to have, to have low birth weight, is more likely to um, be uh, a preemie, is more likely to have its own neurological and physical problems because of the stress that the mother is going through. And that doesn't even include things like maybe she's not eating, maybe she doesn't have nutrition, and maybe, you know, she is getting beaten and the baby is getting injured in utero. You know, there, it's, it's horrific. And when people hear me talk about this, they think that, well, that's just this really small percentage of the population. It's not really that many people. But the problem is that's not true. It's so many people in our population. And um, we only hear about the high you know, the, yeah. we hear about the white girls who, who disappear, you know? Right. Um, we well, yeah. I mean, this, this case with Gabby um, that's in the news, which I love that it's in the news. Cause I think any opportunity to have a conversation right. about domestic violence that we, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about sexual violence with me too. And I love that, but I have been waiting, like, when are we going to talk about what is, you know, has its own nuances and this case with Gabby, I love that it's in the news because it does show a lot of the mistakes that are frequently made in law enforcement. That is what the nonprofit Eric and I have started is about, is how do we improve systems response? You know, give them a lens of what it's like to be a victim, explain to them why they're doing something that's counterintuitive. But uh, going along with trauma, um, you know, something came up and it dawned on me. I was talking with a group of girlfriends. I'm lucky to have a lot of girlfriends who are really, really honest and forthcoming. And right when this law passed, um, I had a group of friends and we were talking about the law and like, how is this real? And I remember one of them mentioned, you know, one in four women has had it. And um, I think the challenge that it dawned on me is how many women um, because this is like domestic violence, it's not something we talk about, you know, women who get abortions rarely post about it, right? They're not like tagging themselves at the abortion clinic. So it's really, they are left to kind of experience it alone. And we have been taught to feel shame about it. And, um, 
you know, whether you grew up in a family that would do that or you just, you know, I think people underestimate um, how difficult this choice is for every woman to have to make, a, you know, a bad choice between two bad choices. And it dawned on me how many millions of women who already experienced a very personal trauma, how many of them now feel that much more shame on top of it and are going to go deeper and deeper. And we're talking about like, how, how can we have a lawsuit? It would take a brave woman. Like what woman can be the face of this? She'll get shot leaving her house. And it really, really resonates with me about how it's exactly the same with domestic violence. It's behind closed doors. If we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. I'm here to tell you it exists. Men are killing wives. They're killing women. All these missing and vanished women are not missing and vanished. They've been killed and hidden by their ex-boyfriends and husbands. And so we have to start having that conversation. But I think that role of trauma is really important because while they're taking those beatings um, and they're pregnant, can you imagine how that makes them feel? You know, the stress. I, you know, I, I didn't fall. I had kidney stones and a lot of throwing up during pregnancy. But when I had that kidney stone at five months and didn't know what it was, I went into a panic. I can't imagine if someone were actually, you know, hitting my stomach or doing something like that. And we are asking and forcing these women to go through that. Um, and so I, I think that we have to consider how many women, while they might be silent right now, we are adding an additional layer of judgment and trauma and a layer of guilt. And you don't think abusers are using that right now? Mm-hmm. Oh, and I think, I, remember I, you got I, abortion when you were 15? And what, you know, you're talking about tactics, right, Kelsey? I mean, whether we're talking about pregnancy pressure, whether we're talking, you know, pressure to either get pregnant, right? This is your worth. This is your value. If you love me, all the tactics that abusers use. um, I really think we have to look at the, at at reproductive coercion on a state level. I mean, particularly SB8 and, and similar copycat laws. I mean, think about it in effect, right? The state is now a tool that abusers and rapists and traffickers can use to not only force women to either get pregnant or continue a pregnancy, but to give birth against her will. And you think about like what we went through when we talked about pregnancy pressure, birth control sabotage, and controlling pregnancy outcome. By having any any unrelated human being be able to bring suit, that just reminds me of of an authoritarian regime where neighbors are reporting on neighbors. Well, Mm -hmm. batterers use isolation. Batterers pour, you know, figuratively or literally gasoline on a victim and then come at her with a match and people want to know why she's upset or yelling. Law enforcement wants to know what's that. And so, again, I really think we have to unpack how is the state, how are these state legislatures right now any different from batterers? How is this not reproductive coercion on that huge scale? Because right now they're doing those very things. And they're using those very tactics. And just like, you know, just like abusers say, well, I love you, but then their behavior doesn't match. And I know we're going to give them this in the third podcast, but you know, like you said last time, Kelsey, when the state tells you they're pro-life, but then they do all their behaviors are the complete opposite. You have to, we we have to, to reveal that, right? We have to. Yeah. And they're going to unpack that in our next episode. So um, I think that's a great place for us to wrap up today and um, and invite you all to come back next week and hear the third um, uh, episode of What's Abortion Got to Do With It? I want to thank Kelsey McKay and Erica Olson and, of course, the wonderful Hope Cat Skibbs for hosting us at Incandescent Women. Um, And we will see you next week. Thank you.